Thank you. Hello. How's everybody doing today? Yes. All right. So let's get this party started. Ah, cool. So I was asked to come up here and to talk about how the creative world is changing because of, thanks to AI. I don't know how to say it exactly, but <laughs> because of AI or the impact that AI has. Um, but just to first off, you know, like, hey, I'm Josh. Uh, and, but who am I? Uh, well, first of all, I am a photographer. You know, there is no such thing as a photographer that doesn't have a moody, brooding, black and white selfie. So I am definitely a photographer. I am also a product manager. As you can see with my nice little Bill Gates-esque style photo of me hugging a computer uh, from way back in the day. But I'm also a dreamer. I've worked at a lot of different products and a lot of different companies. Um, I've been very lucky to be in this space for about 20 years. I uh, started off in 2001 as a photographer slash product manager in digital photography. Over that time, I have seen the photographic world change like crazy. And today in this talk, I'm gonna be spending most of my time focusing inside of photography because thanks to all these devices that people have in their hands right now, photography has empowered us like basically to through mobile photography is what I meant to say, to become a photographer. So everybody in here is basically a photographer. Oftentimes I go into a room and I ask people, hey, how many photographers are out there? And often, frequently, not many people raise their hands. But then you say, well, how many people take pictures every day? And like everybody raises their hands. And so like, why are you not considering yourself a photographer? You are a photographer. To be a photographer, you don't need to only just wear black. Uh, you can also be a photographer wearing multiple different colors, as you can see with my hair. Um, so yeah, let's, let's talk about some fun things. Begin with, though, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are familiar with AI. There's a lot of stuff inside of this talk that I'm going to be going through that has some references to some terminology. It's usually just nice to have a little level setting to make sure that we're all good on there. Um, so first of all, you know, what is AI? Artificial intelligence. We can read this nice little uh, Google sourced quote. You know, the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. Now, that's something that I think we all know roughly, obviously, or even that definition, even a better definition. I'm sure there's lots of PhDs in the room. I have a BFA, so I'm not smart. But <laughs> I have the right brain, not the left brain. Um, but yeah, so we have this kind of uh, ability to do artificial intelligence because what, the computers can help us do more. There's also stuff like fuzzy logic. I remember like when I was first thinking about technology, I remember I got like a camera in like 1993 and it had fuzzy logic inside of it and it was so exciting. I didn't, what is this fuzzy logic? I like fuzzy things, I like logic. Is it like a really hairy Vulcan? I have no idea, but. <laughs> It's a, it's a you know, branch of logic designed to allow degrees of imprecision and reasoning. So the idea being that like, oftentimes, like we work inside of this creative world where there's no such thing as the hard black and white of logic. So you need something that says it's better or worse. And so like, this idea of fuzzy logic is, is really, really helpful, especially inside of the world of creativity, uh, because you have things that are like very, quite possibly, unlikely. It sounds like something on a, one of those uh, magic eight balls. So, but Next one, machine learning. Uh, it's a branch of artificial intelligence. Computer generates rules, you know, basically trying to uh, learn through the process, going through this. Uh, you insert a lot of information. You know, Noel was talking about all these models that are being used and provided thanks to Microsoft and a lot of the data that's been done out there. There's a lot of research, there's a lot of open source models that are out there. The idea of allowing a computer to derive certain kinds of systems from a huge set of data can be really, really helpful. And we'll talk about how that works out. And the finally one, the neural network. Uh, and this is where you hear a lot of these terminologies coming up more and more today, whether it's machine learning, neural network, a uh, adversarial neural network. I mean, the words get really, really long. It's kind of like German. You just keep on putting more words in front of it, and it just becomes one long sentence. Um, but yeah, so the computer system modeled on the human brain and nervous system. So that's pretty cool. So but what does this all mean? What does this matter? Well, the thing is that AI is all around us, and it has been all around us for a long time. Very frequently, we like to think of like AI is this new thing. AI has only become something in our modern lexicon uh, because it's really cool how the technology works, and frankly, a lot of uh, technology companies are having trouble selling more and more stuff, so they have to put more words in front of things, so it sounds even cooler. Um, but when you think about it, 
we've had like since 1996, like this camera right here started introducing light meters with AI. So again, we're gonna talk about a lot about photography stuff, but it all kind of comes together. So what this whole idea is that we had these cameras, for a long, long time we've had cameras that could try and measure the light around us. But if you've ever taken a photo, especially with one of those older cameras in a really difficult lighting scenario, let's say that you're going skiing and you've got this super bright surface on the ground in front of you and a kind of a blue sky. Now, normally speaking, a camera would point at that scene and it would take a picture and everything would come out mu mu bleh, muddy and dull and boring. With an AI-based light meter, it can say, oh, the white on the bottom, that's probably snow. So therefore, let's change the exposure based off of the fact that we now have this information. So for example, in this camera in 1996, they included a database of 30,000 different scenes. And inside of the camera, it would analyze what you were pointing it at and deciding, well, what should you do differently to compose this scene based off of this kind of built-in model of 30,000 different scenes that it would compare against. So just thinking about like, we didn't think about AI in 96, and of course AI was even before then, but here we had devices in our hands that would do these things for us. We got uh, autofocus with AI. So there's been lots of different versions of this, but Sony has done a really amazing job where they created this four-dimensional tr subject tracking. So you can point your camera as a photographer at a subject, and it would be able to predict which direction that object would be moving in so that it keeps track of it, keeps it focused, so that as a photographer, all you need to do is press the shutter button. In photography, we have this concept called the decisive moment. And that decisive moment is, in some ways, or maybe the, all the ways, the most important thing that you as a photographer can do. You are curating the world around you and so you need to be able to just press that button exactly when you mean to press that button and you want it to come out well so with a technology like this uh, AI based autofocus tracking system you as a photographer can be very very capable and comfortable just pressing the button when you need to we probably have seen this uh, I think uh, Phil Schiller came on stage at one point at one of the uh, WWDC's from Apple where he was talking about how the iPhone 10s uh, running in iOS 11, created this much more advanced technology stack so that when you press a button, a whole bunch of things are happening. And the goal, again, for this is to remove any of those technological barriers that get in your way, that prevent you from capturing that photo exactly as you want it to be captured. Moving right along, more other amazingly awesome technology, also based off of, this time, a convolutional neural network. Like I said, you just keep on adding words in front of the things and it becomes really cool technology. Um, the idea behind this, now, I'm sure that a lot of people are familiar with the fact that you've got on your phones, oftentimes, multiple little lenses, and when you take a picture, it can do that thing called portrait mode. And that portrait mode is really, really cool. You know, when, when talking to consumers of photography, the number one thing that people will say that identifies an image as taken by a professional is that the background is out of focus. That idea of having that shallow with the field is oftentimes the hallmark of somebody who is a professional. But whenever you want to create that, that means you have to carry with you a very, very large camera. And that means you have to have a large lens and a large sensor and have to have technology and you have to have knowledge and you have to have experience, you have to really care about it to be able to do that. But with something like these convolution neural networks, what we can actually do is we can compare a bunch of photos to photos that have basically already set up with the out of focus background, identifying the characteristics that make that background look that certain way, identify the object and the subject inside of there so you can pass a single photo through this neural network and the output would be a mask. And that mask can then be used to separate the subject from the background and then you can apply a blurring effect to the background. And what's really cool about that then is you don't even need any longer multiple lenses to be able to do this effect. You see like the iPhone uh, XR, the Google Pixel, these all use a single lens and create that depth of field effect by separating the subject from the background and blurring the background. And what's really cool about that is that this means that it doesn't even need to be done only to these new photos that are captured today. With a convolutional neural network that can apply this depth of field effect, you could take one of Ansel Adams' photos and you could create that effect to it. You could basically put it through any single photo that ever existed. And there's even really cool things you can do with these depth, field, uh, depth maps that we'll talk about in a bit. Other things that have been coming out, focused on uh, some of the problems that people have today while capturing their photos. So Google Pixel also came out with a technology called uh, Night Sight. 
And what this functionality can do is it, again, identifies characteristics inside of a photo that might have certain levels of detail that are too dark to be able to be seen. And then identifies, well, how can we brighten them using a neural network to be able to identify the characteristics of a bright photo, the characteristics that might be hidden inside of the shadows. And sometimes even with some of the technological artifacts captured in a photo, such as noise, how does it reduce that noise, retaining actual detail, and brightening it up? basically giving you the ability to take photos in near darkness that look really, really great without having to carry lights around with you or without, again, having to carry a tripod. So this gives us the ability to take really amazing photos just on our phone with all of this technology running locally. Already, there's a lot of different companies out there that have this technology stack. Uh, so for example, you have the ability to do object and face recognition. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to very quickly scan through an image, using a neural net, identifying those objects that are throughout the image. So for example, it could look at this image on the top left, and it could say, oh, well, there's sky, clouds, sunrise, there's a tree, there's a forest, there's a lake, there's a water. And you can use all of this different information so that I can actually either search for it, or it can recommend edits to, for me about the things that are done inside of there. Same thing with these uh, face recognition. So um, this is from when I recently hiked up Kilimanjaro. Uh, Kosh was our fearless leader, uh, my fiance, and a random guy from Nova Scotia. Um, he was a nice guy in the end. Um, but yeah, so like, really, really cool that I don't have to search for these people. I don't have to type these tags in. I can find people really, really quickly and easily, and I don't have to worry about spending the really obnoxious time that it used to take to catalog all of my photos. We now have technology that does this for us. There's other things that are coming out that are really cool as well, like AI-based image stabilization. So this photo I actually shot on my iPhone, standing on a subway, and I didn't use a tripod. And it was using an AI-based uh, stabilization technology stack to be able to let me just take a photo. It takes a series of photos really rapidly in a row, automatically analyzes each of those photos, stabilizes them, stretches and warps things because you don't only move in a very perfect way this way in translating in an x, y uh, coordinate path. You also move in a z, and you're tilting your phone around. And so like, as I'm just standing there and the subway is moving, my camera is taking lots and lots of pictures. The software is then going in and figuring out how to stretch, transform, and warp everything so that it actually goes into a state where you can then overlap and kind of blur the differences between every one of those different uh, frames while also applying a temporal transform, meaning that it actually looks at and it predicts the movement of one object in three-dimensional or even four-dimensional space. The end result is, as a photographer, I can now take 10, 20, 30 second long exposures without a tripod, they come out rock sharp, and then I have this ability to create long exposure effects really, really easily. So. As a creative, I now can create without carrying as much equipment with me, or I can create like on the fly. I don't have to plan everything out. There's other things also. So Google announced another one, which is fun. Um, this one is their super resolution. And the idea is that it can use capture multiple frames at once to be able to, because again, your hand is naturally moving as you're taking photos, and it can fire off those frames, looking at the accelerometer, looking at how the, the frame is shifting from one to the next, combine that information together, so as what you can see at the top, this is how a normal digital picture is captured. Each pixel only captures one color. So there's a red pixel, a green pixel, and a blue pixel. It's inside of an array. This is called a Bayer array. But what the uh, kind of super resolution technology does is, it basically waits until the camera moves around a little bit, because you're naturally going to be moving your hand, even when you're trying to hold it rock still. It'll actually shift around, take multiple pictures. The end result is, instead of having a bunch of question mark, uh, it actually results in pixel detail everywhere for every color. The end result is amazingly high resolution images, again, that you're capturing from your phone. The idea being, what could we do to make our phones as good as digital SLRs? And we're getting there. We're getting to that point now where you almost don't need a digital SLR to capture really, really high quality professional images. Um, at Adobe, we've also created some neural networks that are focused even on like the more uh, nerdy side of things. Um, we have like these technology called enhanced details that uses, again, a convolutionary neural network to identify at a sub-pixel level image information to basically boost the resolution of your photos by a couple hundred percent. 
So it's kind of crazy about how we can use all this technology to be able to improve on problems that exist in the real world so that we have that ability to create really, really high quality photos. We also have things like this content aware fill um, where it makes it really easy for me to just go in there and say, hey, that thing, that little Jeep, I don't want it. And then it just does it for you. So the idea is like, how do we then create better quality imagery without having to do all of the work and energy and effort that it takes to become really good at this. I, what's that? This is Photoshop. <laughs> yes. The end of the world begins with Photoshop. So we have over here another technology that's inside of Photoshop called Select Subject. This one also uses machine learning to be able to identify objects and so I just say, select the subject. It uses salient image technology plus a bunch of different neural nets to identify what do we think? What does the computer think is the subject matter in this image? And then automatically select it for you. So that it goes through and makes sure that it creates a really, really high quality mask for you and makes it so that you yourself do not have to go in there and draw around it. So what's next? Like what is this all adding up to? And this is the thing that I think is really, really interesting. One of them is ability to create more powerful depth maps. And what a depth map is, I was, I was kind of hinting at this earlier, a depth map is basically a three-dimensional representation of the scene around you when you capture it as a photo. You can imagine that normally a, a photo is captured in the X and Y domains. A depth map adds the Z domain into it, so basically the depth information. So now we know this object is in front of this object or behind this object or it's at the same plane. And what you can do with that is you can make incredibly powerful selections. You can say, select the, the object that's closest to the lens. You can naturally fall off of the effect. So if you want to add a little light to something, you can make sure that because light falls off in a certain way and we know how light falls off, you can project a light onto a subject and through the depth map decide how do you want to relight that image? You can use these depth maps to do all kinds of things, and because we now are having the technology to be able to create a depth map off of any photo, you can basically create higher quality selections and higher quality edits by just looking at a photo and having the photo guess where the objects were within the scene. We're going to have more and more of this automatic scene recognition. So this is uh, Huawei phones. They came out with AI technology to be able to identify when you're pointing the phone at different subjects. It knows, oh, this is a food photograph. This is a person. This is a, a landscape. This is a travel photo. And it adjusts the edits and the processing in the camera as you're taking the photo. So again, reducing your need to do any kind of post-processing because it knows, hey, for a subject matter, we want the face to be light and bright. Or for a food photograph, we want the colors to be really poppy or for any other kind of scenes that it can come up with. And these are just an example of all the scenes. Um, and of course, who doesn't like a fluffy Samoyed in the photos? Um, other things, super zoom. So this is another technology similar to what uh, the Google super resolution was doing by increasing the resolution in there. What you can do is you can basically create it's sometimes used, the terminology is hallucinate, because like the computers have to dream about, uh, there's probably a Philip K. Dick about machines and magic mushrooms somewhere out there, but the idea though is that you can take this information, and you can look at a lot of information that already exists out there, and guess what detail information may have been inside of that area, and then allow you to zoom in without even capturing a super high resolution file. Because this gives you the ability, you know, we think about some of these technologies, we think purely sometimes only on, hey, what can I in a developed nation do with this? But imagine what you can do with this in a place where you may not have super high quality internet signals, where you need to be able to transfer really small files around. You need the ability to be able to capture uh, information on smaller phones that may not have as much uh, storage capacity, et cetera, et cetera. These technologies not only help all of us to create where we already have really powerful technology, but it helps people create in places where they may not have access to as much technology. We talked about the fact that you can use some of this technology to make better selections. Like when I think about uh, what are the biggest problems that people have inside of the creative world today, it's usually making selections. 
ability to tell a computer, hey, that's a dog, and that dog's hair ends here and the couch and starts there is really, really tough. But that's really something that we want to be able to do. We want to be able to say, oh, I want to take this dog out of this picture. I want to apply it to this other photo. Or I want to merge things together. Or I really want to put a lizard head on my face. So these are all things that I want to do on a daily basis. But it's very difficult because, again, as we talked about earlier in this talk, I'm not very smart. So I can't do it. But AI. Um, Recommended edits, like being able to say like, oh, we looked at your photo, we know what this is a photo of, and here's some things that we can recommend to you. Because there's a lot of this opportunity in which we want to be creative, we want to try different things out, but we may not even know what we want to do. And so being able to use AI to recommend how you would want to edit your photo. Um, another one, making your photo look like another. I think a lot of people are familiar with the idea conceptually about style transfer. There was a product called Prisma that made your photos look like a Van Gogh Starry Night, and you would look at it, it would look really cool, um, and that was fun, but it had its, its time. There's also this idea, though, like, I just want my photo to look like a normal photo, but I want it to look more like this one. Either I get, didn't get the light right, the I don't know how to use the photo editing tools, I needed to like get a better, like, uh, version of that person's smile and face. We can be able to use this technology to be able to say, hey, I want to create something from this photo. This photo, I like the smile, I like the lighting, I like the color. I want to copy that effect, I want to apply it to another photo. And this is something that becomes really possible with AI, which is really neat. Um, we talked a little bit about relighting a photo. This is a new technology stack that came out of the Google Research Labs pretty recently, which is pretty neat, where what you can do is, you can take a photo and you can make it look like it was shot in a studio with a completely different lighting scenario. So the um, Apple iPhone had that technology in the portrait mode, which is really neat, but it's kind of like a very, very beginning version of this. The, the technology that's uh, the research lab, which is right now just a paper, um, nobody's really turned this into something practical in a product just yet, but it's always fun watching what that, those folks do. Um, is really interesting because now we have this ability to do that much more. I mean, how many people out there have a studio at home? Like, not many of us have the space, especially in New York, for lights. Lights are big, but imagine if you could just do this all without having to go out there and buy a whole set of lights. NVIDIA has also a new technology stack, which all is based off of analyzing a bajillion, which is a technical term, photos. And that bajillion photos then turns into a subset of different kinds of like, characteristics. And what you can do then is, using a sketch that basically is the limit of my sketching capability, um, you could actually create this really wonderful like, photo. It's photorealistic, but this photo doesn't exist anywhere. There's no place in the world that looks like that. But it's taken together a bunch of different photos and broken it down into its sub like, component parts and then put it together for you automatically so that you can draw and create new things that look like they actually existed. So what does this all mean in the end, right? What are, what are we going to get to? What's coming up? One, the barrier to being a creative is changing. I think this is, to me, the most important thing. So in the past, in order to be a creative, you had to have a lot of money. I mean, just think about it. Like the privilege that I had to go to a four-year school on photography. I've thankfully since then traveled around the world, met lots of people who would love to have had that opportunity but could never afford just the ability to not work for four years, let alone to spend the tens of thousands of dollars per year to go to that, that university. Um, it takes a lot of time. Like I've been practicing my art for almost 30 years now. It's been more than 30 years now, since I was nine, and I'm 40. So it's 31 years now I've been practicing my photography and getting slowly better and better. And of course, it requires some thought. The good thing is that the thought part is universal. Everybody has a brain. But what I want to do is I want to help out. I think a lot of other people in this room want to get to this point where we can empower people that all you need is an idea. And once you have that idea through technology and through AI, you can create anything. And I can't wait for that time. Thank you.